She's now the next panel. So this is Engineering in Space. And the patron for this panel is going to be uh, John Chinner, who works for Airbus. As I'm sure we all know, Airbus have been involved in a whole world of projects recently, including the one that I work on, Bepi Colombo, heading to Mercury, among many, many other projects. So I'm excited to hear more about that. Um, John, I'm going to hand over to you now to, to start your panel. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Susie. Pleasure to meet you too. I was just listening to the tail end of that panel before and um, I was sat here with a big grin on my, spa on my face and, um, and then realised I actually had something to do. So uh, <laughs> it's quite engaging and it's, and it's fantastic to see such a diverse group of people coming together and talking about cool things in space. So well, I've I just got want to say, just briefly, I love your background. Is that Tim Peake I can see behind you there? It's not a fake background. That's actually, this is actually my workshop. So I've got flat Tim <laughs> behind me and I've got a few of my Mars Rover friends behind me. So this is my workshop where some of the magic happens that isn't necessarily Airbus stuff. So um, yeah, so, so flat Tim was always keeping an eye on me. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Over to you. Thank you. Well, yes, welcome to the Engineering in Space panel. I've got a fantastic uh, group of, of panellists with me today. We've got a really, really interesting time. And uh, I think the hardest thing today is going to be squeezing everything into the time we've got. We haven't got um, a very long time. I think we could talk about these subjects all day. Um, and we'll have to make sure we keep an eye on the time. So, yes, I'm John Chin. I work for Airbus Defence and Space. Um, I am based in Portsmouth and Airbus Defence and Space has a few sites in the UK, in Stevenage and Newport, and lots of other sites across all of Europe in, in places like Germany, France and Spain. So Airbus Defence and Space build things to go into space. It's fantastic. We also do networks on the ground. Uh, ground stations supporting satellites. So some of the things you might have heard of that Airbus Defence and Space have done was um, the Columbus module, the European uh, Science Lab on the space station, uh, where, where Tim Peake spent most of his time doing science. That was built by Airbus Defence and Space. Um, so you've got Solar Orbiter launched uh, February last year, already taking fantastic images of the sun. What else have we got? Um, oh, yes, the European service module, one that I particularly like. Um, so that's, this is a service module to take astronauts, uh, human crews back to the moon. So the service module, if you think about Apollo being a, a crew compartment and a service module with all the stuff they need, that service module is being provided by the European Space Agency and built by Airbus. Um, and what else have we got? Oh, yeah. And not forget the ExoMars rover. So uh, lots of talk at the moment about Mars rovers. But, um, you know, I've been focusing a few years now on talking about ExoMars. So ExoMars being a European Space Agency mission to go and look for signs of past or present life on Mars. The rover of which was built um, and integrated in Stevenage. OK, so up in Stevenage in the UK, this rover is going to go and search for life on Mars in, in, in 2022. It's going to launch and get there in 2023. Quite exciting. So it's really, really exciting to talk about ExoMars while we're thinking about Mars. So I'm going to go around and ask the panelists to introduce themselves and tell us what the thing that it, that they find the most fascinating about engineering in space. So let's go over to Hannah. Hey. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Hannah. I'm an industrial placement student in the dynamics group of the environmental testing division at RAL Space. And I'm between my third and fourth year studying mechanical engineering at Lancaster University. Uh, RAL Space, over the years, as part of STFC and on its own, has contributed to various uh, space projects, including the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's, it's contributing an instrument, the uh, MIRI Mid-Infrared Instrument, um, to the James Webb Space Telescope that's due to launch uh, later on this year. And it produced, um, provided uh, some imaging devices, charge-coupled devices, they were called, um, to the ExoMars mission that um, John just mentioned. Um, within the dynamics group and the testing division of RAL Space, we can do various tests. One is called the thermal vacuum testing. So it simulates the environment of space for different spacecraft and satellites and components, taking them up to very high temperatures that they would see if they were facing the sun and down to the very, very cold temperatures they would see if they were facing away from the sun. And it does all that in a vacuum to simulate space. We can also test for electromagnetic compatibility between components, so seeing if the higher levels of electromagnetic radiation in space interfere with the functionality of electronic components and whether it causes them to um, interfere with themselves. Within the dynamics team, which is uh, my group, uh, we can, it is simply testing objects that are in motion. So from vibration testing, which simulates the launch environment of a spacecraft and uh, components to see whether it can withstand the very, very high accelerations that, um, that will appear during a, a launch environment. 
And then we can do pyroshock testing, which simulates um, other parts of operation and launch. So it could be the uh, stages of a rocket uh, separating causes a shock response within the, within the structure. It could be solar panels unfurling in space, or it could be um, uh, CubeSats being deployed. Um, the things we usually test at the minute are instruments or small spacecraft modules and components. Um, we're building a new building right next door to where I am now called the National Satellite Test Facility. So soon we will have the capability to test full size satellites and spacecraft. So that's going to be really, really exciting to start in the next year or so. Um, the shock work that I focus on uh, is, is a fairly new test to us. So we're in the middle of developing the test, both the hardware side and the software side. And actually today, after our finishing off this, we've got a, um, uh, someone coming in to do some testing for a spacecraft component. So that's be, that would be really fun to do. Um, I have a prop here, actually, if people want to see it. Uh, this was something I wasn't here when we uh, tested this, but this is a model electronics box. I don't know if we can see that clearly uh, for a surface temperature radiometer, which monitors the temperature of the earth, of the sea and of the land. And this flew, uh, the, the, the real one of this um, flew on the Sentinel-3 mission that is uh, currently up in space, I believe. Um, and uh, my favorite things, the most amazing things that I think about space is, um, I love the novelty, the newness of the work being done and the pace of the technology being developed as we strive to explore further with um, crewed missions, with robotics, with satellites and with spacecraft. Um, for me, the best thing is that we can constantly push boundaries of how far the human race thought it could go. And the engineers are the ones that get to bring those impossible dreams to life. Fantastic. Uh, thank, thank you, Heather. I mean, it, your enthusiasm comes across the screen really, really well. So, uh, thank, you. so thank you for that. I'm going to move on to, uh, to Rhys Williams, Flight Sergeant Rhys from the Royal Air Force. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Flight Sergeant Rhys Williams, and thank you very much for inviting me to this. It's a shame that we can't be doing this in person, but obviously current restrictions prevent us from doing so. Uh, I am a cyberspace communications specialist in the Royal Air Force, so I am slightly different to Group Captain Cooksley from the previous uh, panel. Uh, and my job is uh, working for HQ Air Command 2 Group Space Engineering Role Office. I've done nearly 30 years in the Royal Air Force, but only three years working in space. But my background is primarily in radars and tactical data links equipment. Uh, my current focus is for the radar that is based at RAF Filendales, which is a, uh, a radar that looks up into space primarily for ballistic missiles, but also as part of the, the watch over the Earth of everything that is orbiting around the Earth. And, and that is where one of our greatest challenges occur at the moment. If I can give an example of how effective our radar is, uh, imagine 3,000 miles away and you are tracking something about the size of a tennis ball. Wow. So it's very, very good, but bear in mind the tennis ball is quite large and there are lots of other bits and pieces that are flying around up there that are a lot smaller than that and traveling at very high velocities that will cause severe damage to all sorts. If I can give you an example, there's uh, approximately 120 million bits of debris that are approximately between one millimeter and one centimeter in size. And that traveling at the velocity that it is around the earth will cause a nasty damage to something if it encounters it. Yes, of course, not just the, the size of the object, it's the speed it's traveling that imparts the energy as well. So, uh, yeah, good job. I mean, we forget sometimes about the, uh, the things that are required in the background to make space flight happen. And uh, the, thing, the thought of a radar pointing up into space, tracking tennis balls 3,000 miles away, that's fantastic and sometimes forgotten about. So what was the one thing that was you, you found um, fascinating or inspiring about space then, Rhys? I, I think from what Group Captain Cooksley touched on in his previous panel is about how we're going to set up satellites around Mars. Um, 
we currently have a load of stuff flying around and a load of active and deactive satellites and and it's getting quite congested up there in fact it's very congested and so it's the getting, earth. yes indeed so it's now getting very dangerous so this is a good time to start thinking about in the future when we do colonize mars is we've got a blank canvas to start working from. And we can start thinking about how we can put into place the measures to be able to effectively control what is going around Mars so that we don't end up in the mess that we're in at the moment where everything's just been thrown up there. Also, I, mean, I, love, I love your optimism. The, uh, the phrase you use, when we colonise Mars, not if, it's when, which is good. I, li I like that kind of positive uh, take on things. I know it's going to be really difficult to go and send humans to Mars, but yeah, when is a, is a good way to, to, to label it. So thanks for that, Rhys. So next on my list, I've got uh, Dr. Helen Miles um, from Aberystwyth University. Hey. Come and introduce yourself. Yeah, I've, I've got shed envy, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. My name is Helen Miles. I am a lecturer in computer science at Aberystwyth University. So um, computer science, a lot of people immediately think of uh, just as being kind of coding uh, but actually it's a lot more than that um, it's it's actually a kind of it's an interesting subject because it sits kind of between science and engineering I think it depends what stuff you do as to which kind of direction you go in um, and my particular focus is actually computer graphics so um, looking at uh, sort of the visual aspects of things and simulating things not not graphic design like designing leaflets and things but actually sort of simulating how things will look um, and I was lucky enough to meet at the university. There's a, a couple of people in the physics department who were already part of the ExoMars mission. Um, and I got talking to them one day over lunch. Um, and it turns out, actually, we have an awful lot in common because computer graphics is all about uh, trying to take the laws of physics and use them to simulate how things will look. And even in you know, your, your movies like um, Pixar films and that, they will be using uh, physical principles to make things look right. In computer graphics, we tend to cheat a little bit and, you know, make some of the calculations a bit simpler, but the principles are there. Um, and so I, I managed to get involved in the PanCam team um, with, the, uh, with the, the camera on the ExoMars rover, which has been mentioned a couple of times already. Um, and I've been helping to work out what the camera will see. And it's just so, so cool because who even would have, well, I, I wouldn't have thought that computer graphics could be useful for this. Um, and I think that's that's my favorite thing about all of this. And it's, it's sort of been mentioned already by a couple of other people. Um, you can be into all kinds of different things and still manage to get involved in some of this stuff because we need people who do all kinds of different things. Um, and so here I am in uh, little old mid Wales, um, feeling like I'm a million miles away from any, everything sometimes, but actually I'm, I'm able to contribute to this and that makes me really happy and really excited yeah, that's fantastic thank you helen i mean i i know we spoke last week but i think what resonated with me is is that we all talk about these missions and we talk about um you know mars rovers doing science on another planet but actually the, these this this science this data we get back from from mars is, is no good unless we are confident in it and and from from what you're doing is is giving the scientists the confidence in, in the data and the images they're seeing and, and knowing that if they see something interesting it is a genuine interesting thing and not an artifact of the uh, method of generation or being sent back to the earth and yeah you know you, you think about the end-to-end -end chain for for that science to arrive in that scientist's hand there's there's, there's so many things that can that can get in the way along the way and, and lead to false positives and i think perhaps we've seen mm. some false positives in in on mars in the past and perhaps science is slightly more robust now they able to throw those things out so uh, Thank you for joining. And I know you've got some props to show us later, but I've got this thing just, just hanging around below me here as well. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we've got Hemant from Teledyne E2V to tell us about what you do at Teledyne. Hi, uh, thank, thank you again for inviting me to this. I mean, I'm just an apprentice, but it's good to be involved. Um, so like I said, like John said, I'm from Teledyne E2V, which is uh, in Chelmsford at the moment. And um, I'm working as a apprentice mechanical design engineer. So what I mainly do day to day is pretty much working on designs that will eventually in five years or 10 years end up in space. And uh, my company has actually worked on loads of things such as the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover, the uh, ExoMars one that was mentioned quite a few times. And there's also Sentinel-3 and the Hubble Space Telescope. So uh, what we specialize in is mainly CCD imaging sensors and we actually manufacture, I think we're one of the, well, I think one of two manufacturers who actually produce imaging sensors 
from the silicon and uh, straight to the final stage where, where they do get sent off to, to space. And um, so what, what I do is package them. I make sure that they uh, have a mechanical interface that interacts with, with the actual imaging sensor and weeds out that data into a, uh, an actual digital image. And um, so the parts that I design will physically be touching space in, in a way. So it, it's, it's, it's interesting every day because I can, I can, like I said, work with customers like NASA and ESA. And um, yeah, so that, that's, that's mainly what I do. But uh, like you, the question you asked was about what I think is interesting in space. And I think for me, it's, it's the fact that everything is unknown. We, we still haven't explored uh, to the extent that we could do. And I think, I think the space, the observable universe is about 93 million light years. So we, we're just a tiny, tiny fraction of that 93 million light years, and we still have that scope to 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 go there and to to um to explore everything. Space exploration is is a very very big area. So for me, it's just getting to that point where we can uh, at least enjoy at that little fraction, get closer to that 93 million light years away. Fantastic! That's, Thank you for that. Yeah. That's uh, so. I, I hope that the that the group here are um, you know showing a, a whole range of backgrounds in, in space engineering and not what you imagine in, in off the top of your head of what a space engineer looks like so um, we've got what well, we've got we've got an ex-apprentice a current apprentice a current uh, student uh, of engineering um, a flight sergeant in the royal air force and the doctor i think that's pretty good going ex-apprentice and not in that so there we go so we all see lots of things on on tv on 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 twitter or on facebook about us flinging things into space, things we've built, things engineers have put together, but there's a whole life cycle for those things before they even get on that launcher. And perhaps we could start in the design phase with you, Hamanth. So what things are critical to you in terms of the design that you're thinking about for something to go to space rather than something that maybe wouldn't be going to space? So for us, I think the main thing is about materials and uh, material selection is very important when, it, when things are going to space. Uh, what we use is mainly ceramics as a, as, a, as a choice of material because it can withstand the, the temperatures of, of space and as well as uh, interact with the with the electrical side of things. And um, when, when I said earlier about imaging sensors, we use a silicon because it's the best uh, sort of conducting material for for taking images and and reading them out. Um, then it comes to sort of uh, the actual shock and vibe testing that we do. I know that Hannah's got a lot more input on that, but um, we have to consider the extent of the actual material and to see if it can actually withstand the temperatures, the, the pressures of space and the travel to, to get to there. So I think, that, I think that's the main bit for me. It's, it's taking into all those things into consideration, but making one small product that will eventually work. So you'll be taking that thing and designing it with an eye of sending it off into space, but of course we wouldn't be able to send it to space unless we knew it was gonna work when it gets mm -hmm. there. So this is why places like Rail Space with your testing facilities are really important. So, so what would you do to, to Hermant's black box then, Hannah, to make sure you could uh, sign it off and say it's going to work when it gets to space? Oh, yeah, there's, there's lots of um, various testing phases that it would go through. Usually you'd start, uh, you have a, you've got a module, you've, you've built it, you're, you think you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. Uh, you, you take it to vibration testing first, which will test whether the structure, as Hamant says, is sound enough and is strong enough to withstand the launch environment. That's the first thing, first thing it's got to get through before it can get to space and be operational. So it's got to be able to withstand that. If you need to do any shock testing, which is usually done on sort of a prototype model, a qualification model rather than the, the flight model, which is um, far more expensive and you really don't want to break it. Um, if we need to do any shock testing, it will, could be done then as well, before then a thermal vacuum testing to check that it operates correctly under the, the vacuum of space and that all of the components can still function correctly and any optical um, devices are still aligned properly when they're um, subjected to various um, temperature extremes. So you can have one side is very, very hot facing the sun and the other side is very, very low temperature facing out into the, into the blackness of space. Um, electromagnetic testing is only done um, on certain, certain items that, of it, that it requires, that it, it's required to do. Um, and it would only be for electronic equipment as well. So if there was electronics and as a Hamantha um, and his uh, optical uh, imaging devices there, 
you would test to make sure that nothing could interfere with the, the operation of those electronics, because if you get it to space and it doesn't work, then it's, it, you, you can't go up and fix it. So it's better to, to, as in the design phase, you've got to get it right before it goes up to space. So that's what the testing's about, the final checks to make sure that everything's as good as it can be. Fantastic. And of course, you've got to check that your thing you're going to send to space isn't going to interfere with anything that's already there. So there's some pretty stringent requirements yeah. for sending things to the space station to make sure you're not going to switch on your little black box and, and suddenly the space station goes dark. So it's a very, very important thing to do before you get anywhere near a launcher is to test your piece of hardware. So mm -hmm. this hypothetical piece of hardware then has done all this flight testing. It's been stuck on a launcher and fired off into orbit then, Reese. I'm assuming your, your radar can track it on its orbit. We can give us some data on the ground about what it's doing up in space. Yeah, so um, everything that gets launched up into space will already be pre-warned to all of the space agencies that it's going up. Um, we are just one of a, a net of radars that carry out space surveillance, uh, not just the United States of which ours is plumbed into, but also uh, European and other countries. So amongst us all, we'll be all watching to see this go up and make sure it goes to where they say it's going to, because before you can launch it, you have to say exactly where it's going to go and and to start off with and where it's going to finally end up a bit like when a plane flies from a to b you have to put in a flight path there's the same principle for rocket launches as well um, you have to bear in mind that depending on where it is launched from the earth's surface will depend on whether or not the radar will see it to start off with but it will most certainly see it as it passes over as the it goes into the cone of the uh, the surveillance beam that's amazing. So I guess for for your radar, it's dual purpose. You're looking for bad things heading our way or in the way of the Americans. So you, you need to have a background of information so you know what's good to be able to identify, I suppose, what's what's bad and amongst all that data. Indeed, there is something called the space catalog, which catalogs everything that is up there that we know about to a, a certain size. Uh, and that catalog is only as good as the data that is put in it and sometimes depending on what that item is the data may not be as accurate as it possibly should be um i won't cast aspersions on certain countries as to why that would be but obviously the role of that satellite might not necessarily be what it's been sent up there for uh, we will monitor that as it comes into our field of view and we will compare the data and also if something starts behaving erratically if it's picked up by another country it will be passed on uh, and it will be monitored and you can then see whether or not it's uh, um, it's been put in the right place for the correct procedure it's up there for or whether or not it's up to something else and there's been quite a few well documented incidents of satellites being moved around and you have to be very careful because uh, with orbits and uh, of other satellites going around, you could end up moving into an orbit that's already occupied. And before you know it, you get a massive collision in space. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's intriguing. It's fascinating. It's subject all in itself, isn't it? This, this, this subject of uh, what things are doing up in space. So, right. So this, this hypothetical thing we've sent off into space, then let's say it's a, it's a camera imaging sensor and we're going to land it on Mars. So it's, fl it's flown to all the way to Mars. It's taken its, its nine month transit to Mars, successfully landed, which, which is really easy to do. It's landing on Mars really easy to do, as we've seen the Americans doing on a parachute, on a sky, sky crane, making it look so, so easy when it's not. So we've taken our, our sensor, our cameras, and we've, we've plopped them onto the surface of Mars. Um, how do we know they're any good? Because we've got a camera there and it's been tested on Earth. We've now sent it to Mars. Mars is different. How do we know that that sensor is any good and sending us data that we can, be, we can trust in? Helen, I'm sure you can tell us. <laughs> yep. Um, well, so uh, the, the difficult thing about um, sending a camera to Mars is, is all on top of all of the things that people have already talked about. So we've got um, you know, you have to really carefully design it to make sure that um, you know, it's possible to send it up and, and everything like that. Um, once you actually get to Mars, you need to make sure that what you're getting back is um, what the camera is actually seeing. And the, although that might sound a little bit strange, um, the, the way I tend to describe it to people is that if you were to um, get your um, phone or your digital camera out on Earth, um, you have various bits of uh, code that are running in the background, which help do things like white balancing, uh, making sure that the um, the colours are right for the light you're in and stuff like that. 
we don't have um, the ability to, to do that kind of thing um, on Mars because we can't see what environment we're in without the camera taking the photo. Um, and so you have this kind of um, Cats 22 where you can't know exactly what the lighting is um, using the system that you've got. So the way that we deal with that, and this is something that um, NASA um, are doing, so you might have seen similar things, is we've got something called a calibration target. And I have here, one of my props is, this is, um, this is actually the life test model of the uh, ExoMars calibration, PanCam calibration target, PC2, um, along with some other bits that um, I will mention in a moment. And the whole purpose of this is that it provides um, a reference because we know exactly what color each of these patches are. We can then um, compare photos of the real thing on the real rover when it sends photos back. Um, and we can work out what the actual lighting conditions are like and use that to make sure that we have actual reliable data. So I suppose the, the, what we're doing here in Aberystwyth is uh, between sort of hardware and software, we're kind of the glue in the middle between the, the, the camera and the uh, scientists at the other end, making sure that the camera system, no matter how well you try and make it, there's always issues with cameras because, you know, you end up with, uh, after a while, you might have dead pixels, things like that. So we are gonna have software that will actually um, make sure that none of that gets to the scientists and they look at it and think, ooh, there's an interesting shadow there. Maybe what, you know, maybe there's something interesting. Um, that, will, that will not happen. We will make sure that they get accurate data. Um, and it's quite cool actually hearing everyone talk about all of the different processes that, uh, that it needs to go through. Cause actually this has been through um, thermal cycling and shock testing. Um, and in fact, I have a, another, another one here. Oh, this one's quite heavy because of the box it's in. Um, I have another one here. I don't know if you can see, possibly not on the camera, but actually one of the pieces of glass broke <laughs> on an early model of it. So um, the design was changed. So, and, and this is, you know, this is what it's all about testing things. Um, and I see you've got a, a model of the rover. Well, there. I was just going to jump in and say that there's, um, there's a, obviously the, the, the XMI's rover looks like this. These are the total panels that deploy out, but the, the target is actually placed on the front here, isn't it? This little square. I know your model you've got there, Helen's got the target on it, isn't, hasn't it? Mine hasn't. <laughs> yeah, it so has. the, the target is placed there important. on the rover mm. and the, the pan cam actually goes through a process of looking at the target from, from the head, looking down and, and taking images of that target. And of course, you've got a reference from Earth. You've taken images of that target on Earth and you can compare what comes back from Mars with what you've taken on Earth. So, and, you, and you've seen this recently, um, probably with, with Perseverance, lots of images coming back of the targets on the rover and people going, well, what's that? And it's this thing checking itself out when it gets there and looking around its body and seeing, because you've got, you've got some markers there that are on other places. Yeah, on so these, these three things at the bottom um, are actually what we call fiducial markers and they are placed around the rover deck. So they're sort of on the, the three three sides, which PanCam is not on basically. And the first thing that it will do, because it, it has to travel to Mars all folded up. Um, yeah. And the first thing it'll do is spend a few days kind of unfolding itself um, and uh, and then actually making sure that everything is where it should be. Um, because if something goes wrong, we want to make sure that actually we can account for that. You know, if, if the mass doesn't quite get to the right position or something, we can still work with that. But we need to know what the difference is, basically. Yeah. And I'm going to use my position here as to ask a question of you. So what do you what do you about, about dust then? So obviously dust is going to settle mm. on the rover. Dust, dust is going to have an impact on the solar array. Um, this is a question purely from me is... Can you can you determine how much dust is on the rover from looking at those images? Are you looking at the, the the target and saying there's so much dust and therefore we should see a corresponding reduction in solar array power and things like that? That is exactly um, what we are just starting to work on at the moment. So this is kind of um, science as it happens. <laughs> um, yeah, so absolutely. Mars is a really, really dusty planet. Um, and one of the, the, the problems that we're going to have, because this calibration target is flat and it sits on the front of the rover, it won't be long before it's got a little layer of dust over it. Um, and obviously that's going to start to change um, the way that the light interacts with it because things will get less clear. And um, we're not we, we have some idea from from previous um, NASA missions of how the, the dust might affect things. But the dust is different everywhere on Mars and because we're landing somewhere we've never been before. We don't know exactly um, how this dust is going to be compared to other dust. So, we, you know, we're going to have to work some of it out as we go along. So not um, all mass dust is created the same. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we are actually working on um, software solutions. My, my colleague in physics, Matt, is actually in the process of building um, 
an exciting new piece of kit that will help us um, test some of this. So keep an eye out for, for incoming news on that. Because what um, I find intriguing is that this ExoMars rover should have already launched. It should, you know, there was some delays to the programme. It should already be on its, on its way and probably landed by now. So you'd, you'd still be doing these things. So maybe the two year delay for Earth and Mars to go around the sun again is actually giving you a little bit of breathing time. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There's, there's an awful lot for us to learn. I mean, NASA have done this successfully a few times now and they've learned a lot along the way. Uh, we're still kind of learning because unfortunately Beagle 2 didn't didn't quite work out. Um, and so, yeah, the, the UK team and, and the sort of ESA wider team are, are still trying to work out how some of this works. Um, but yeah, yeah, we yeah. are. We are going to work out how the dust will land and how we can compensate for that, hopefully. That's a good message for me for, for space engineering is that to fail is not to, to fail. If you can if you can mm. fail and learn from it, then you're you are learning. And um we have this thing where we talk about failing fast or iterative engineering and, and, and finding the failures by failing is not a bad thing. So you, it's almost contrary to life. You get told to have success in your life, but actually to, to, to be an engineer and go and find the failures means you're not, you're not going to find that failure when that vehicle is on another planet. You're going to find that failure in the lab and mitigate it there and then. So, you know, these, these things like Beagle, people say, oh, Beagle, but actually Beagle gave us some information that we can we have influenced us in our, in, our, in our future missions so i'm going to start going through some questions now because i know we've got a few questions coming in and i'm going to throw questions at you panel and you did volunteer to come along so i hope you don't mind um so i've got one i saw on the list here and i am going to ask it to you reese did you track the meteor that came down over the uk last week or the week before uh, I personally Which, didn't, but I'm I'm pretty certain that our radar did because something that size coming through the atmosphere will be obvious. Um, so I would have to answer yes, but I can't say for definite yes or no. So your 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 equipment would have been able to see that coming, or maybe have tracked it after the fact. Perhaps you'd have gone back and had a look at your data and seen if you could see the track. It probably would have got tracked live uh, because they do live monitoring of all of the satellites. So. It, they would have shown up as something tracking across the sky and they would have had to have identified it with it being something that wasn't a satellite because they would have known of everything passing over. So it might have caused a little bit of alarm if they didn't know it was coming. But the trajectory that it came in through would have proven that it wasn't from uh, uh, it wasn't an Earth launch. Okay. Okay. So I guess this is the thing you look at some data and go, what is it? You know, and you don't jump to conclusions necessarily. Yes, it's probably get best not for us to jump to conclusions because <laughs> that would that would cause a little alarm and panic. A big red button in the corner, is it? <laughs> I, I can't honestly say. <laughs> but we can all imagine, can't we? We can all imagine. Um, there's another question in here. and, I, and I, I, Some of the questions are a little bit abstract for the people we've got around the table at the moment, but um, I'm going to go for it anyway. So... There's a question here about how long would it take to render the rover simulation. Now I'm going to I'm going to make my own interpretation of that and, and throw that at you, Helen. When you're talking about rover simulation, so I'm, I'm assuming you're doing quite a lot of simulation on Earth now and, and prior to the to the rover landing to to make some more data points for you to compare to in the future. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, it, it depends on very very much on what it is that you're simulating because I I don't personally simulate. Uh, you know the whole rover i'm focusing on what's happening with camp with pan cam and i'm mostly focusing on um so so um pan cam doesn't actually take color photos um it, it takes uh, monochrome photos but it uses filters they're a little bit like sunglasses basically so it can look through different color um, lenses and get different data um and so some of my colleagues in physics have been working on um an emulator which will let you check out basically what the, the different filters will let the camera see. But what I've focused on more is um, simulating what, what the camera will see from its viewpoint. It sounds a bit strange, but um, because of the cost of the rover and the way it's been built, um, because it's, it's sort of built folded up and, and it's got a really tight schedule and all that, um, there's actually no time to take a whole load of photos of from the, the, the kind of final, um, point where the so so you when you had your rover model before so it's a bit difficult to describe without props <laughs> i got a small um, one. Oh yeah there you go so um the when when it travels to mars the mast will actually be folded backwards um, i need, the, I need over... the big one for that <laughs> you got it there there you go it's oh lovely thank you <laughs> i would so, say it's um... stowed actually i think it's lost 
Um, oh no. <laughs> oh, here we go. It's just in a couple of pieces. So yes, it's folded back, isn't it? It's folded back and it tucks in over the ground penetrating exactly, radar. Exactly, it does. It? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, when it's put together, um, there are some very limited tests run with it actually with the mast upright, but mostly um, they're more focused on, on basically getting it ready to go and making sure that everything's, um, you know, keeping everything clean and everything's very complicated. Uh, so they're doing sort of as little as possible um, with the kind of real rover. So actually um, doing things like checking what the rover can see um, at a certain angle, if it looks backwards at a solar panel, can it get a, a particular angle of, of light, for example, so that we can do some tests with the dust and stuff like that. Um, so I've been simulating things like that. And to simulate an image like that, it really depends on whether you want to make it look really realistic or not. So if you do, you could be rendering one picture could take you um, an hour to come out with something like that. But if you are doing a really simple, what can I see? You don't need any fancy lighting or textures or things. Um, and you can get something back in um, you know, a minute. So it, it's a very, very, that's a complicated answer. I, um, I, I hope it did answer the question. <laughs> no, I'm sure it did. Thank you for that. Um, okay, I've got another question here and we're moving away from Mars a little bit here and more about uh, space debris. And it's coming from uh, Roger. Jagodinsky, I hope I've mentioned uh, said your name correctly, from 7S at St. Michael's College in London. Um, and I'm going to ask this of Hermanth and then on to Hannah. So this is about, um, there's a question about, is there is it possible to, to board a rocket which will return to Earth in one piece and doesn't leave any debris behind? Now, I don't want you to answer that question directly, perhaps, but think about, does the does space debris, rubbish in space, it's a hot topic right now, does that filter down into your into your jobs you're doing right now does that does that come through to you Hamanth? um so personally for me it doesn't actually come down to, to what i do i i do mostly just make sure that i design something that that does go to space and that does survive in space but part of what i do is sort of sustainable design making sure that it's not using like i could probably make something that uses all the material in the world but i choose to make it so that it's efficient so that it doesn't actually leave much debris in the space in space when it does you know if it does have a collision with something else but um but yeah in, in terms of general design we have to make sure that it, we don't send something up there that's that's material not being used thanks so much and hannah have you got anything to add um <clears throat> sorry um i yeah i don't particularly uh work on anything that would um perhaps come back to earth again and yeah thinking about the uh, space debris but as the question said um i i think yeah that that's what spacex are working on now with their with their rockets that are returning to earth the first stage rockets returning and landing again safely yeah. I know they've had some mishaps but um that that that's what it's all about really especially when we're thinking of engineering in space um whatever you think of elon musk he's an engineer by training and and that that's what he's trying to do really he's trying to think of a better way forward for the future as um reese said as well we've got um ever ever um expanding range of satellites um around earth and eventually the space is going to get filled up so we need to be thinking of a way to either take some of that debris out and remove it or to make rockets that perhaps don't create the debris in the first place. Um, but that's definitely something that would be tested and then it would come as um, any, anything that goes up to space would be to a testing division to, uh, to check that it will still survive. So if it's if we, we, we can, we might be able to build something that won't create the debris, but if there's a specific design issue that it needs to have in order to come back to Earth correctly, but that means that it won't survive the launch, then it, it, it's sort of, it's weighing up the, the pros and cons and thinking about the costs and benefits of what, what is possible with the current technology and trying to really push, push through that technology to make it better. Thank you, Hannah. So there's another question um, talking about uh, robots and perhaps vehicles in space having cameras. Um, I I don't design cameras for space, and I know that probably the rest of you have probably seen some 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 space uh, mission cameras. So the question is, do they have shutters to protect them? Now I know um, Solar Orbiter has shutters to protect the cameras because it's so close to the sun; they need to be protected from heat. Um, but I guess. Um, Hamanth and Hannah, have you ever have you ever seen any shutters on cameras? And 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 Helen, have your are you aware of any shutters on the ExoMars rover? Who's going to go first? 
I'll go first. Uh, so yeah, I think with with the actual mechanical interface I designed, we don't usually put shutters on there because uh, that that goes to the next stage where NASA will have to integrate it to their system and when they do put it in there, or NASA or ESA, whoever, and when they do put it into their uh, their system, they can add shutters. But uh, in terms of the camera that we design, it, it's purely just a silicon piece, which reads out the information and takes digital images and processes them. So not from my point there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I do know actually of um, uh, programs and uh, projects that have been going on in RAL space um, that my mentor works on. Uh, and she was wonderfully helpful and has uh, told me all about different um, optical devices, optical alignments and mirrors and those sort of things. And with those, you can create little um, caps that go over them to protect them during launch and from any sort of debris or anything until it gets to its operation. Now, some of those have to be taken off before launch. Um, they sort of get a little red tag on something just before it, it goes uh, um, integrated to to the launcher, to the rocket itself. And others, you could leave the cap on if you've got a little um, little lid for it. If there's a way to open that in space to allow the optical device to start working, then that's also something that they can do as well. I'll come in now then. Um, so on, uh, on ExoMars, there are for, for PanCam, there are not shutters. Um, they, they, they have um, baffles, which are the little kind of cone shaped bits that, that sort of protect the, um, the camera system a bit. Um, but generally, uh, there's, there's not an awful lot we can do about some of the dust. <laughs> um, I, I, I do notice actually there was another question that was about dust on the, the, the cameras for Perseverance. And I, although I don't know um, quite what they're doing for Perseverance, I, I do know that for Curiosity, they did have some issues. And if you've ever, um, I've, I've heard um, stories uh, that, that they've given in talks, so you might've heard this before, but they did have some issues where one day they sort of noticed taking a photo, that they had this kind of weird line um, and it turned out that a load of dust had sort of built up inside the, um, just inside the, uh, inside the baffles. And when they sort of looked the camera down, they managed to get rid of a lot of it. Um, and, and actually, after um, a conversation about this, um, the, the design for the baffles for um, XMR has got modified slightly. So they've got little drainage holes in the bottom now for the oh, sun right. to go out of. Um, so, you know, we, we can definitely learn things from, from each other. Um, it's going to be an issue, but uh, we're just going to have to try and do what we can with XMRs, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. And, and I guess that, that leads me to one of my favourite subjects, and that's yeah, we're learning through international cooperation as well, and that we don't do all these things on our own in isolation. We can learn from the lessons learned from other missions um, and integrate those solutions into our vehicles. We're going to build better vehicles, aren't we? So, um, yeah, there's a question here. Uh, and I might pick that up. So it, it says, and it's from um, Amanda Groombridge and it's from Annabelle. Will the spacesuit fabric test samples on Perseverance be returned to Earth via the ESA sample collections? Now that's, that's that question rings out to me because I'm a I'm a spacesuit spacesuit and Mars rover nerd. So um, um, so I don't know if you know, but Perseverance is actually going to stash some some samples some some samples in in little containers and leave them on the surface for a future rover. Um, uh, being designed and built by Abbas Fenton Space in Stevenage um, to go back and collect the samples and take those samples back to a vehicle that will then send those samples off the surface of Mars and send them back to the Earth to be analysed. So, so at the moment, all of our vehicles are doing uh, sample analysis on the surface, sending data back. And this is an idea to send samples back to actually get real Mars dust, real Mars rock back to the Earth. And, and this mission is nuts. If you think about what it takes, there's, there's two rovers and the associated vehicles to get those rovers to Mars. There's a, a vehicle to get to Mars to bring the, uh, the, the the launcher from Mars back to Earth again. It's just, there's, there's drawings out on the internet. You can see this mission, it is crazy, but it's it, it shows that actually when we pitch our ideas high and we try to test ourselves and we challenge ourselves, we can do some fantastic things. And you, and you think all oh, those things have to happen right in order for that to work. And when you see a, uh, you know, you see something like Perseverance on the surface of Mars, you see, you see a rover there. And I'm, and I'm really looking forward to seeing images of Perseverance taken from the helicopter as well. So, you know, the, for me, that context of seeing a rover on Mars, not taken by itself from its own cameras, but actually from somewhere else looking at it, it's, 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 it, it makes me think of, you know, the, the Buzz Aldrin visor shot taken by Neil Armstrong, when you've got this human being stood there on, 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 on the moon and you're never gonna see these images soon. Um, 
But you think about all the people behind that, all the engineers, all the scientists, all the supply chain people, all the people that are machining things. And all of that has to happen and all that has to happen right. And it all has to happen in the right order with intolerances and often by people who are low bidders and things. So, you know, it's it's an amazing work of achievement and, and collaboration and people working together and talking and communicating and all those things that perhaps when you think about engineering in space, you think about people with, with tools and spanners and and things and actually there's a whole load of world behind that which is you know people working with bits you know zeros and ones in images there's there's people working with software there's people working in 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 all sorts of things in software engineering you know just in testing you know you, you maybe not so glamorous but actually really really important you know really really important and you know right back to the design engineers sitting at their desk thinking this thing is going to go off to to space at some point in the future and and, and that that thought of you know, I hope it works. And I hope if it doesn't work, it's not my bit that doesn't work. I mean, that must be terrifying, right? They're having that, that thing that you've got something that's critical on a mission and you've got to go and do it. So um, to answer the question, I don't think the spacesuit fabric test samples are going to come back with the samples because the spacesuit fabric samples aren't probably going to be left in a place that they're going to be grabbed and put into the stash. If they do, something's probably gone wrong and a spacesuit samples spread across the surface of Mars probably to go along with a, a rover that's been spread across the surface of Mars. So um, the spacesuit samples probably won't come back. I don't know for sure, but I, I imagine not. There'll be, um, but just think about this. Perseverance is there, not just looking for samples. It's taking all that science with it to think about the future, creating oxygen on Mars, 3D printing on Mars, flying helicopters on Mars. Um, it's really exciting. But the one thing Perseverance, Perseverance doesn't have, which I, I really want, to, to, to tell you is that it doesn't have a two meter drill like ExoMars, okay? Now I bang on about ExoMars all the time, but ExoMars, the rover from the European Space Agency is going to go land on the surface and it's taking a really big drill with it and it's gonna drill down two meters. And in the session before they were, there was talk about the harsh environment on Mars and the fact that the surface is bathed in radiation and anything that's living is probably not gonna be on the surface. Um, all the rovers up till now, including Perseverance, are literally just scraping the surface. ExoMars is going to go look for interesting things below the surface using ground penetrating radar and then stick a sample drill through it and pull that sample out and look down two meters. And it won't, it won't get to that point without the, the panoramic camera being there to, to look around and see things around it and navigate itself on the surface of Mars. And it won't, it won't be able to do that unless all those pieces of engineering have been designed and tested properly by engineers like the people on the panel today. So it's a massive team effort and a massive collaborative team effort. And I guess the message for me is that we need more people to join the team. And we need more people to think about the skills they've got and how they can apply those skills to space engineering, because it's not just about people with spanners and, and screwdrivers. It's about the whole broad range of subjects. And I love to do a thing where people ask me, a, they tell me a skill they've got, and I try to say about how they can use it in space. And perhaps, um, it, I set myself up for a fall sometimes with these things, but I've not failed yet to find some way someone's got a skill that they can use in in, in space. Um, so, you know, it, it, if you're out there listening to this and you think you'd love space and you think maybe that engineering isn't for you, science isn't for you, then maybe it is. Maybe you need to just think about the things you enjoy doing and perhaps you can bring them along to the space industry because we're a, a massive team doing massive amount of different things. Um, you know, and you, as you can see, we're all quite passionate about space. You know, we all love space. Space is, space is exciting. Um, someone said to me, if we could send dinosaurs into space, we'd have had all the excitement on the planet wrapped up because dinosaurs are exciting and space is exciting. We should send dinosaurs into space. Um, but perhaps, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps not. But the thing is, looking for signs of ancient life on Mars is that kind of like looking for dinosaurs in space to me a little bit, isn't it? You know, things that might have lived there in the past, um, you know. Um, See, there's me going on and on and again. So you get me on the subject of space stuff and I can't help but waffle on. Well, I'm going to have a quick scan through the questions to see if anything else has come in that I can throw to you guys. Um, uh, right, let's have a look. I'm going to have a look through the questions. So uh, any of the, uh, the, the guys on the line, have any of you guys got anything you want to say? Anything you want to add? Anything you've thought of along the way? Anything you want to add to this panel about space engineering? Perhaps give us a little nugget of inspiration for the people who might be watching. Um, I just want to add earlier, like I was saying, like, the main reason I got into space is because of the whole unknown and the things that we don't know yet about space. And I think I read somewhere that um, if you studied the same subject that interests you for five years, about halfway through that, you're going to stop asking how much more can I learn and start asking, what's my limit? Like, where can I stop? And at what point do I stop? And with space, I don't think there is a point where I would think I can stop because of the fact that it's so wide. So I think it's engineering is a small part, but, you know, just working together to get there is i think would be amazing so more people will get involved the better absolutely absolutely 
What about you, Reese? We haven't heard from you for a while. Got anything last? Anything to add? I was just just going to say that there was a, a question came in earlier on about space debris, uh, and and it's quite timely because this weekend, uh, an, uh, a firm called Astroscale are, are getting a mission launched into uh, into orbit, and it's taking with it a little target satellite, and it's going to test out a, a method of using magnets to, uh, to to capture this little satellite. So it, we are trying to work it out for large items but for smaller bits that's going to be uh, somewhat more difficult fantastic thank you thank you reese now i'm going to i'm going to thank the panel here before i hand back to susie and just say thank you for thank you for volunteering thank you for putting up with me and thank you for you know putting yourself out there to to ask to answer these questions because i know it's not easy and i know you're you're all really busy people so thank you very much from me and i look forward to seeing you all again sometime soon in person maybe <laughs>